Okay, so. Uh, oh. You mean the. Yeah. I think it's resizing. Oh, well, thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, that's fine. Okay. So uh, I'm going to pick up the story on black hole and neutron star systems in our galaxy from yesterday. And uh, before delving into the new material, I just wanted to revisit one um, very useful topic or a question that came up at the end of lecture yesterday. Uh, so we were discussing what is the, the RMS variability that we see in the time domain. So I just wanted to show you a, a visual example of this. So this is um, uh, looking at Maxi J1820, so a really brilliantly bright black hole transient that went off uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and this is nicer data of that system. And in blue points here are hard states, red point are soft states. And what I want to draw your attention to is, uh, so these very short time segment uh, show that there's huge variability. So there's a lot of scatter within the hard state and in the soft states, it's relatively confined. So this sort of large amplitude flickering, this is really um, you know, manifest in the light curves as real sort of flicker variability. So that's what the RMS is capturing, but in the power spectral domain. Okay. Uh, oh, yes. And I wanted to uh, correct. Yesterday, I said that black hole outbursts look like turtles. Uh, Nicer is amending that view. They look like dolphins to Nicer. Okay, so for today, I want to tell you a little bit more about black hole systems, um, delve a little bit into QPOs and black hole spin. Uh, I'm going to then touch on neutron stars uh, a bit more and tell you some more of the neutron star taxonomy and some of the characteristics of uh, neutron star uh, energy and power density spectra, and just a little bit uh, on equation of state. Uh, and then what I want to do, uh, time allowing, is end with a little uh, walkthrough tutorial, um, just some of my own advice for uh, spectral fitting. If um, those of you who are interested in X-ray binary systems may find this useful, those of you who are not may not find it so useful. So you know, uh, feel free to uh, check your email or something. That's that's I won't be offended. Okay. In any case, let's. Uh, so black holes characteristically produce a wide range of uh, QPO phenomena. So what I'm not mentioning here is a very interesting set of a uh, small number of high frequency QPO detections, which people wonder may be connected to the spin of the black hole. Uh, here instead, I'm focusing on low frequency QPOs, which are really universal in uh, black hole systems. So these are subdivided into three sets, uh, a type A, a type B, and a type C. Um, Despite A coming first, it is the rarest among these. Uh, A's show up very broad looking. And I, I should pause and mention um, this power density, this is a power density spectrum. And what you're seeing here is sort of a broad structure. This is power that is centered at a characteristic uh, resonant sort of frequency, but it, it, it's not a coherent frequency. You see um, a, a wide breadth to that feature. So this is what we call the QPO. Um, so type A's are very broad. So this Q factor says, uh, describes the uh, central frequency divided by the width of that feature. And so it's just uh, usually a, a few for a type A. 
These are very rare and they show up right around the point in the hardness intensity diagram where the jet is launched, right around that jet line. Um, type Bs also show up right around the jet line. They're more commonplace uh, and they're also sharper. And if you look closely, you'll see that this isn't one broad QPO, but it's rather a complex of three. So the, uh, there, there's some difference in terminology, but usually the peak is uh, referred to as the, the QPO. The higher amplitude would be the harmonic and the smaller one below it, we would call the subharmonic. Um, in addition to these type Bs and As, which are relatively fixed in frequency, there are type Cs, which march all around in frequency, uh, scaling with the mass accretion rate, so the brightness of the system. So they move very dynamically over the course of a black hole outbursting. And these show mostly in hard states, but also through intermediate states too. So uh, in broad brush, this is the kind of timing phenomena we see in outbursting stellar mass black hole systems. And I wanna just give you a, a flavor for what some of these QPOs can look like. So I'm picking a, a, a fantastically brilliant example. So this is Maxi 1535, which gave, uh, I, I believe, the strongest um, signal of, of QPO features that we've had yet within a black hole binary system. So these are just um, quite lovely here. You see these two big peaks at around two and a half and five hertz. So that's a fundamental and a harmonic. Um, and when we follow those, not just in a single snapshot, but in time over the duration of an outburst shown here with a light curve, you see these, these QPOs here in a heat map, they dance around in frequency quite a bit over the course of this outburst. Um, and uh, so th this sort of movement um, and the disappearance and reappearance it gives us some clues into an origin. I should say the, there's still uh, a lot of debate about the precise physical mechanism that produces these QPOs. Um, and something else that is uh, very fun that you can do with time variable phenomena like this, if you have sufficient signal, you can do phase folding on the QPO frequency uh, and uh, try to do things like phase resolved spectroscopy. So this is some work by Adam Ingram on Maxi 1535 doing just this. And you can see some of these uh, physical quantities are moving around at the QPO frequency. Okay, so that's just to give you a little flavor of these uh, QPOs and black hole systems. I now wanna to turn to uh, black hole spin, which you heard a lot about from Dan already. And uh, I'm gonna reemphasize some of those points because I think some of this gets a little bit nuanced. Um, but uh, the, the technique that I'm going to introduce first is uh, continuum fitting, which is distinct from the reflection method. I'll come back to reflection measurements of black hole spins uh, for stellar mass black hole systems uh, in a bit. So the goal for most of the techniques used to measure spin is really to determine this, the radius of this ISCO that uh, Dan described. So again, that's the innermost stable circular orbit. And this is a, a feature of general relativity that you can't have stable orbits within some fundamental radius uh, around a black hole in GR. And what's important there is that the ISCO radius is a strong function of the black hole's spin. So if you take a non-spinning black hole, uh, in this case for a 10 solar mass black hole, uh, the ISCO would be uh, 6m or 90 kilometers. And if you uh, had a cousin that was the same mass, but uh, a maximal rotation of one, that ISCO radius would be six times smaller, 15 kilometers. And the consequences of that are that the inner disk becomes much, much hotter the closer in that you go. So this is much hotter, much more luminous, um, and also uh, relativistic distortion becomes more and more extreme the closer you get to the horizon itself. Okay, so uh, the continuum fitting method is, uh, I think, a very intuitive uh, means of, of uh, measuring this, this size. So hopefully all of you are um, quite familiar with black body radiation and the way that we have determined the, the sizes of stars uh, that we haven't been able to spatially resolve um, for, for uh, many decades, if not longer. Um, 
so the way this is done is with a, a single record of flux, you can measure a temperature. Um, and then if you are able to measure the distance, say by parallax, then you can independently solve for the radius of that star just using the, the, the uh, distance and the, uh, and the flux and temperature as your three inputs. So with this kind of relationship, you can solve for the radius uh, of a black body emitter. And um, the, distance, the difference here between uh, a star and uh, an accretion disk is that instead of a single temperature, you have temperature that is a function of radius and this uh, accretion disk system. So that's an important thing to account for. Um, and instead of being a spherical geometry, you have a cylindrical geometry. So you need to account for an inclination effect. So this gives you a, a different projected area. But the fundamental is the same. You've measured flux. And if you can measure a characteristic temperature uh, for this multicolor black body, then if you know distance and inclination, you can measure the radius of that ISCO. Uh, and if you want to turn that into a dimensionless spin parameter, you also need to know the mass. So that is for a distance, inclination, and mass, a single X-ray observation can give you a spin measurement. Um, and just to say slightly more about how this is done in practice, usually we like to apply this method when it's uh, cleanest and most uh, representative of the, uh, the black hole state that we have observed. So this means we want something that is dominated by that thermal accretion disk component. And this is what we see uh, all the time in the soft thermal state. Um, and I told you before that you know, we need some description of how temperature changes as a function of radius. Fortunately, this has been, this is a solved problem for many decades now. So going back to Novikov and Thorne uh, in 73 in a follow-up work they did uh, the next year with Page. Um, where uh, you can see here different tracks for different spins, um, the, uh, the emissivity as a function of radius. So this is known. And now to show you this in application, um, this is a particular favorite source of mine, LMCX3, where you're seeing a characteristic uh, soft thermal state uh, modeled here with a uh, T-BABS, uh, an absorption in the, uh, for the galactic gas, uh, simple, which describes Compton scattering process, and Kirby B, which gives you the thermal disk emission. And what you see is uh, most of the X-ray emission by far is in this thermal disk component. And the Compton power law is sort of a nuisance. So we can get a very precise read on temperature and luminosity uh, with a system like this. And um, <coughs> Something that's also quite wonderful about the LM, uh, LMCX3 is that um, while it is a, uh, uh, I, I would put it in the class of transient systems, it is still always active. So we have decades of monitoring with many X-ray satellites of LMCX3. And we can, in fact, apply this method to many decades of data with many different X-ray detectors. Um, and what we recover is a very constant value of the inner radius. So we get strong consistency um, uh, very robustly using this technique. Um, I'll point out that this value you see here for uh, Rn over m, which you could use to map into spin, this, this was uh, sort of an uncalibrated pedestal. So we need to know mass, inclination, and distance precisely to sort of shift this vertically to the right location. So that was not done in this analysis. Um, but what we did several years later was we made very uh, precise dynamical measurements of LMCX3's mass, its inclination, and the distance we know quite well because it, is, uh, it lives in the LMC. Uh, and we were able to put all of this information together using all of those X-ray spectra, um, the several hundred, to make a very precise constraint on the spin of this black hole. Here you see a full range of available spins and you get a, a sense of the quality of the sort of result we can achieve. Um, the uncertainty here is not dominated by our um, X-ray statistics. This is very much limited by our knowledge of mass, distance, and inclination. So uh, if we're able to shore those up, we can squeeze that a little bit tighter, um, at least uh, on the basis of, of this model. Okay, so with that as uh, a rough overview of the continuum fitting method, I wanna turn now to reflection. 
that you've already heard quite a bit about this from, from, uh, from Dan, but I just wanna remind quickly, uh, this reflection component is produced by uh, this hot electron corona, contonizing disk photons, and some of them scattering back and illuminating the accretion disk. So this reprocessing of the uh, Compton scattered photons as they strike the disk, this is what produces the so-called reflection component. And um, what we see in this uh, reflection component uh, as a function of spin is that uh, a strong fluoresced iron line and uh, a broad Compton hump at higher energies get increasingly uh, relativistically broadened the higher the spin. So you see here for um, a, a retrograde black hole, a rather narrow line, um, and down here for a maximally rotating prograde black hole, you see a very broad iron line. So this strong difference in uh, the wing, the red wing of the iron line is uh, what we're keying into with reflection measurements of spin. Um, uh, and some uh, very nice slides that I've uh, pilfered here from Javier Garcia, the developer of RELZIL, um, I think illustrate this quite nicely. So uh, again, I know you've seen some of this from Dan already, but just to make this a little clearer, this is showing um, just a, a power law illumination spectrum. So something that looks uh, very much like what you would see characteristically uh, for coronal Compton emission. Now, if you shine this spectrum onto a cold slab of gas, not yet accounting for relativity and not yet including fluorescent emission, so just absorption and re-emission of those uh, and scattering of those X-ray photons in the disk itself or in this cold slab itself, you get this blue curve where you see a, an edge that is the iron, the iron edge, and you see this Compton hump. If you include now the fluorescent emission, you see a strong iron emission. So again, this is all done in a local frame. So we have not yet brought in relativity. When you bring, oh, and, and I wanna say, uh, Javier is coming in a couple of days here. Uh, and I encourage any of you who are interested in this sort of thing to, uh, to talk to him. He's um, an excellent scientist who developed the leading model for reflection analysis. Uh, he's also a good guy, but don't tell him I said that. Um, yeah, and the, so, so to give you a sense now of the relativistic distortion, again, I know you saw some of this from Dan already, so I'll move through it quickly. We're now looking at uh, emission as a function of radius. So a, a fluoresced iron line that's um, emitting different radii. And as you move closer and closer in, you see the relativistic distortions that Dan spoke about taking hold. So you see uh, the Doppler boosting and deboosting, and you see uh, gravitational redshift moving things uh, to lower energies. And when you put all of this together, you end up with a profile like this. So this gives you that broad red wing, which you see is several, extends down several keV from the peak. Okay, so you already saw many uh, 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 fit results to AGN. So while it pains me to sort of skip through, uh, I'm not showing you uh, fits to stellar mass black hole systems in this talk. Um, but what I do want to do is, is highlight for you sort of the different attributes of the two methods. So both of these, importantly, arrive at spin by, by measuring the radius of the ISCO. Uh, uh, in one case, you're using thermal disk continuum, and the other, it's broadened line and Compton hump features. Uh, you use continuum fitting, usually in soft states. You use uh, reflection analysis, usually in hard states. Um, there are some intermediate states where you can try to put the two together. I would say that's um, you sort of run into some practical deficiencies in both when, you, when, when that's tried, but in principle can be done. Uh, continuum fitting uh, as a tool for measuring spin, importantly, is mostly useful for stellar mass black hole systems. It doesn't appear to have wide utility for AGN, um, whereas reflection spin measure, uh, the reflection technique can be used on black holes of any mass. Um, one of the advantages uh, so, so I would say that's the main advantage of the reflection method is just that it can be used uh, very widely on, on, on AGN and stellar mass systems. Um, the main advantage to continuum fitting by contrast is that it's a very simplistic model. There's, there's not much complexity to it. It's just thermal emission uh, from a disk. Uh, whereas the reflection method has more interaction going on. You have a disk uh, emitting, getting scattered in the corona, 
producing fluorescent emission, which has a lot of atomic physics within it in the disk. So there's a lot more complexity at work for the reflection method. Um, so there, I think, is a bit of the trade-off. Uh, the other drawback to continuum fitting is you do need this mass inclination and distance information, which is part of why I wanted to introduce that to you in the last talk. So we again, we get that from ground-based observations, usually in quiescence. Um, uh, and then we can fit all of our soft state X-ray spectra to determine spin. Um, the iron line, its main uh, sort of uh, independent inputs or requirements, you need some prescription for that coronal geometry. So uh, this came up earlier in a uh, question for Dan and um, having, uh, having a, a, a model that parameterizes correctly the dependence of, or the, that structure of the corona um, is, is crucial for getting reliable spin results, or at least for assessing your systematics. And on that note, uh, I would say roughly the continuum fitting systematics have been uh, well explored, and that's uh, the reflection systematics are, are less understood at this point. So we probably both of these have uncertainties of order 0.1 and in sort of a systematic sense of how reliable the models are. Um, but there's a lot of active work to improve this. And of course, a lot of interest in the age of LIGO to um, make further improvements on these measurements for our neighboring black holes. Um, and uh, this is an old chart, but I, I tried to do a version where I updated more and, and it was completely illegible. So I just wanted to flash this up here to show you a comparison between uh, continuum fitting and reflection spins. Um, now this list would, would be a bit longer. Um, and this is roughly ordered from, max, from, from high spin to low spin. So what I wanna draw your attention to is that stellar mass black holes produce many extreme rotators like we saw on the AGN. So spins uh, that are um, very completely consistent with being unity. But we also have several that are robustly very low spin, consistent with being uh, having no spin at all, so being Schwarzschild black holes. So it seems that nature is able to make both flavors of black holes. Um, and I'll say there, there is some tension in a couple of sources between reflection and continuum measurements, but uh, generally at the two sigma level, um, and uh, if, if anyone's curious, we can talk more about that uh, after the talk. Um, so I would now like to turn attention to neutron star systems and uh, tell you a little bit about some of the taxonomy of neutron star low mass X-ray binaries. So in general, there are, are two main types of neutron star LMXBs. People uh, characterize them as Z sources and atoll sources. So uh, this naming convention comes about from looking at fast variability. Uh, so sort of second or several second time scale observations of evolution and color color space. So this is uh, color again is sort of the ratio of counts in one energy band, usually a high energy band to a lower energy band. And if you do that in, uh, uh, if, if both bands are higher energy, that's the hard color and lower energies, uh, that's the soft color. And what you see is that Z sources trace out a Z-like pattern, uh, hence, hence their name. Uh, atoll sources are, are named for producing something like a, an atoll ring um, of, of islands. And um, uh, here this, uh, I'll, I'll get into these different um, labels here, HB, NB, and so on uh, in a moment. But what I wanna draw your attention to is that each of these different branches for uh, the uh, Z sources and also for the atolls, they have very different timing properties as well, where you see characteristic QPOs of one branch and characteristic QPOs of another branch and also very different continuum structures. Yes. Um, those color color diagrams is that from the X-ray? Yes. Spectrum? Sorry, this is this is all from okay. the X-ray. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay. So uh, uh, first, I want to tell you about the Z sources. So uh, the Z sources are further subclassified into two uh, categories. There's uh, the so-called SIG-like or SIG-X2-like SIG like, um, Z sources and the SCO-like Z sources named after SCO-X1, again, the uh, first 
non-solar X-ray source discovered that really gave birth to the field of X-ray astronomy, uh, SCO X1. Um, and uh, so you see the structures of the SIG-like SIG ones and the SCO-like ones are, are sort of um, morphed versions of one another. So the, uh, you know, the peak intensity here, um, I, I should point out the top panels here are showing you intensity on the x-axis and uh, color on the y-axis. The, the usual color color diagram is in the panel below. Um, but uh, the, the, the brightest uh, states for SIG-like and for, versus SCO-like are, are notably different from one another. So there are some characteristic differences, uh, but you can imagine they're probably stretched in some, some manner uh, between one another. Um, we'll return to sort of a deciphering of where those differences come from in a couple slides. Uh, and, and now to show you a little bit about uh, atoll sources. Um, so these are, are generally, um, atoll systems have a lot of characteristics very similar to the black hole uh, X-ray binaries that we talked about, uh, especially uh, yesterday. So their energy spectra and soft states uh, are really dominated by thermal emission. In this case, it's often two thermal components uh, modeled with a disk black body and uh, a black body component uh, in, in conjunction with one another, the black body coming from surface emission. Um, the, uh, the timing structure is quite weak in soft states and it becomes uh, much more pronounced in hard states. So on a spectral basis alone, it's often very difficult to distinguish uh, between um, atolls and black hole binaries. They, they have a, they're very similar um, characteristically to one another. Uh, and now to show you the energy spectra and power density for Z sources, this is showing you a, a SCO-like system. Um, and those different labels here that, that I said I would explain before, these are so, the so-called flaring branch, normal branch, and horizontal branch. And um, uh, what I want to draw your attention to is especially the differences that you see in the power density spectra uh, between these different branches. Um, and notice that non-thermal emission, when it's stronger, you get more power in the, the PDS continuum, just like you do for uh, stellar mass black hole systems. But you also get um, uh, much more pronounced uh, QPOs in the, the horizontal branch um, and to some extent the normal branch compared to the flaring branch. So there's some real structural differences here. Um, a, a really important discovery from, uh, I guess, uh, uh, a little more than 10 years ago now, um, was uh, an outbursting system, uh, XCJ1701. This was the source that cracked the code of the distinctions between SCO-like sources, SIG-like sources, and ATOL sources. The way that it did this was it uh, is, I believe, still the only transient Z source um, that has uh, uh, th that has done anything like this. It went into a, a really brilliantly bright outburst and when it was at its maximum, it looked like a SIG-like uh, neutron star. When it faded a bit, it then appeared to be a SCO-like Z source. And when it faded much more still, it then transitioned into an atoll state. So this source was really key to understanding that the mapping between atolls, SCO-like Z sources, and SIG-like Z sources is a function of mass accretion rate uh, dictating the, the brightness of the system. So the brighter you get, you go from atoll to SCO-like to SIG-like. Um, the next kind of neutron star system I want to touch on uh, is accreting X-ray pulsars. So these are really fascinating systems. There's um, I, uh, well, well over 100 now that have been detected in both the galaxy and our galactic neighbors, the LMC and SMC. These have pulse periods that range from several milliseconds to several hours. Uh, these are generally not radio pulsars. Most of them uh, are only X-ray emitters, but uh, several of them are so-called transitional systems where they seem to toggle between radio states and X-ray states. Uh, these mostly are wind-fed uh, high mass X-ray binary systems. Not all of them, but the vast majority. Uh, and most of those are so-called BE X-ray binaries. Uh, these BE systems 
uh, have a companion star that is very rapidly rotating. So it's a B star that's rotating so rapidly, in fact, that it uh, uh, launches its gas into a disk around it. So it spits out uh, a disk that um, can interact with the, the pulsar system. Um, these are also usually very young and um, they orbit with high eccentricity, which I, when we were discussing kicks yesterday, if you recall, these things tend to circularize quickly. So the, that points to their, their youth, the fact that they're not circularized. And um, taking a look now at the energy and power spectra that you see uh, for uh, accreting X-ray pulsars, uh, I wanna draw attention uh, to these really strong peaks that we see in the power density spectra. So yesterday, a question came up, how do you distinguish between pulsations and QPOs? And hopefully from having seen some of those rather broad and, and fluffy QPOs, you get a sense here that these pulsations, which look very much like delta functions, are, 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 are very narrow. They have an incredibly um, uh, strong coherence and regularity uh, versus the, the, the broad QPO features. So this is what it means when we see pulsations. Uh, the other thing I wanna point out here is that um, the spectra are pretty complex. Over here, what you're seeing in these wiggles at very high energies are actually cyclotron uh, absorption features. So this is uh, electrons that are getting trapped in the, the magnetic field um, that are uh, jumping between different Landau excitation states um, and, and absorbing uh, corresponding patches from the, uh, the emission from below. So these are pretty wild and fun systems. Um, oh, and I'll also point out characteristic magnetic field for these things uh, is of order 10 to the 12, um, uh, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13 Gauss typically. Uh, and you can measure that in fact, uh, from the energy of those cyclotron features. Um, so I told you about how we measure the spins of black holes. Uh, and I wanna just comment on how we've measured some of the spins of neutron star systems. So the, the best case is that you've got a pulsing system, which is a very useful clock to have. Um, but for those systems that don't produce pulsations, uh, but do produce X-ray bursts, um, and there's, I think somewhere in the vicinity of 100 X-ray bursters that, that um, uh, are in the galaxy, these, uh, some of them produce so-called burst oscillations. So that is when looking at these bursts that last just several seconds, um, we have sufficient signal to detect, uh, pulse, uh, to, to detect oscillations in the power density spectrum um, in the typically several hundred Hertz window. And you see that this frequency sort of uh, swoops upwards so it's giving some sort of little uh, chirping effect here, but it stabilizes. And it uh, appears to stabilize, as far as we can tell, at the spin frequency of the neutron star. What we think is happening is something like uh, a thermonuclear explosion, as it lights up, has to travel around the surface of the neutron star. So you, uh, as it's traveling, you don't quite see the full, uh, or you, don't, you don't see the, the stable frequency and once it's engulfed the entire surface, uh, then what you're getting is really representative of the full surface. And so then this, the spin frequency of the neutron star. Um, so there's a, several of these now that have, have been used to measure um, neutron star spins. And as a reminder, um, that maximum possible spin frequency for a neutron star is something around 1500 Hertz. Um, uh, and I, I believe the record holder is still around 1100 Hertz or so. Um, turning quickly to neutron star equation of state, um, there, uh, so NICER, um, which uh, those of you who I've been working with know this is sort of uh, my, uh, uh, my instrument of choice for studying bright black hole systems. It was actually designed not to look at very bright objects, but to look at some of the faintest X-ray objects in the sky but it was designed to do this with very precise timing. And the systems it's looking at are so-called non-accreting millisecond pulsars. So these are systems uh, which have hot spots on them. And uh, just as, as Dan was describing the, the, the extra vision you get um, 
to see towards the back of something, um, depending on your depth in the gravitational well, these, these, these so-called light bending effects, you see modulation and changes in uh, the pulse profiles depending on the compactness of the neutron star. So the more compact it is, the further you can see around the back. Um, so this light bending um, lets you see more of the surface area than uh, you would from just a pure Newtonian sense. In any case, modeling these pulse profiles uh, is, is a very important business to tell us something about uh, the ratio of the mass to the radius of the neutron star. Uh, and so uh, the, a, a landmark result from NICER in 2019 was uh, for uh, J0030, a very um, uh, uh, sort of the, the sweetest of the, the faint pulsar systems that NICER was targeting for this. Uh, putting together several megaseconds of, of data, um, two groups uh, within the NICER collaboration, but working entirely independently of each other, produced different maps for these hotspots. And what you see here is um, a nice animation of the model of the two groups. So one is sort of a, a crescent moon shape, and the other one has a, a sort of a, a, a ring and a couple of hotspots. But what was very surprising here, sort of the naive expectation was you would see hotspots that are antipodal from one another. That's not at all what we see. So there's some sort of uh, magnetic currents that are concentrated um, in some spots around the poles um, producing these hotspots. Uh, and, and so the precise mechanism of producing these structures is unclear. But regardless of that origin, we have now a very precise model here with NICER for those pulsations and the pulse profile. Uh, and that's been used to place constraints in the mass radius plane for neutron star systems, uh, which again rules in and out some of these various models for neutron star equation of the state, which is uh, one of the, the holy grails of, um, uh, of nuclear physics. So this is a very important kind of result. Um, and there's follow-up work which improves upon this and more that is yet coming down uh, the pipeline. Okay, so um, hoping that I have enough time now, I want to close by giving just some practical advice, my own perspective on X-ray binary spectral modeling. Um, so here I wanna give you just a, a typical X-ray binary data analysis roadmap. So often what happens is new data arrives. You, you have a new system that went bang in the night, you get a new data set, you're very excited, you start off and you fit it with a power law. And often that power law is not good enough. So what you do is you add a disk BB plus a power law. And you might see some reflection residuals. So then you'll go to disk BB plus RELZIL and, uh, and do something like that. So that accounts for a thermal emission, Compton emission, and reflection emission. So this sounds good. There's problems. So I want to start at this point where you're doing disk BB plus power law. Uh, so when you're doing the fit and you see you have your data set, which is absorbed by the galactic column, you can't necessarily distinguish uh, between, um, uh, these are two different models for the compensation. One is power law. The other is uh, uh, a, a model called simple that I, I did in my PhD work. Um, uh, you know, these both fit equally well. The problem is when you take away NH to see what your model is telling you physically, this power law model is just e exploding to infinity at low energies. So this is obviously totally unphysical. Comptonization does not do that. What Comptonization does do is give you something like this that peaks at a couple times the disk temperature. So the fact that you have a runaway effect at low energies causes problems. And well, what it does is it introduces biases in your fit results. So they can be statistically fine, but giving you misleading information. So this is a, a cautionary tale, and, and which is just to say, the things that it's doing are really unphysical at energies below the disk temperature. Um, and uh, I, I won't uh, walk you through too much of this, but say it does uh, introduce systematic bias in your value of NH, in your disk normalization, and in your disk temperature. So there's sort of well understood systematics that come from doing this. Um, and this is entirely solved when you use an actual physical compensation model like COMTT or NTH comp. Um, However, models like simple or TH comp more recently um, do something a little better still. Uh, and that is 
that they fold in, uh, they, they account for the fact that Compton scattering takes seed emission and scatters it. Uh, and that turns out this photon accounting that preserves your photon number turns out to be very important for certain kinds of applications. Um, and just to give you an illustration of what this looks like, uh, this is uh, showing you simple cut, uh, sort of a, a variant on the first model I, I showed, acting on a narrow Gaussian. And for ranges of parameters, so different uh, uh, temperatures, different uh, optical depths of your corona, you get uh, power law looking wings like so. And, and so uh, in practice, what you're really doing um, when, when using this model on something like a disk is applying this for seed photons over the full range of energies uh, of, of your model. Okay, and again, I wanna emphasize that in this modeling, photons are conserved. Um, I'll skip past this other, that's just another illustration of this effect. Uh, so is photon accounting useful? Well, uh, a very important, yes. Um, sorry, could you just go two slides back? Yeah. Um, when you were talking about N, uh, NH, you might get a very high NH value. Would you not fix that at the um, at the value from from maps at the galactic value for you know from maps, or do you always leave that as a free parameter? Well, uh, often for sources that are in the galaxy, you don't you don't have a value that is a function of distance through the galaxy. So you you know, and, and often you may not know the distance. So um, there are some some issues. Also, some of these maps have uh, are relatively coarse and a particular line of sight might be a little bit different. But in general, um, if you're doing something extra galactic, which is usually out of the plane, those are quite good at giving you a benchmark gas column. But when you're looking at something in the galaxy, uh, those maps are really telling you the full integration along the line of sight, which could be a lot of gas past the source too. Mm -hmm. So okay. uh, it, that's a great question. Um, So I, what I just want to point out here is that um, when you do proper photon accounting, uh, so this is taking into account the fact that any power law photons you observe must have originated as uh, thermal disk photons, this takes results that were very perplexing to people for a long time, and it makes complete physical sense of them. So uh, originally when people were throwing sort of the, the disk BB plus power law models at things and looking at the radius of the disk as a function of accretion state. For thermal states, they found a constant value, but when they started going into intermediate states, they found that the inner radius was shrinking. <coughs> and sometimes it shrank by large numbers. This is simply an artifact of not having accounted for the fact that those photons in the, the Compton component originated in the disk. And when you do that uh, accounting properly, you see that you get very consistent results between the softest thermal states in red and non-thermal states, or, or uh, intermediate states, I should say, in green and pink, okay? Um, so that's for just the Compton component, but uh, I wanna now speak to how this impacts reflection and reflection analysis, since uh, I expect some of you are probably playing with this sort of thing. Um, so again, here, uh, you know, often the model of choice is disk BB plus RELZO, um, and you can get a great fit. So let's take a look. Well, when you do that same, uh, that same exercise of taking away NH for disk BB plus RELZO, or, yeah, what you see is a Comptonized disk in blue. What you see is the reflection emission is running away. It's doing the same blowing up that we saw in power law. And that's simply because the way that RELZO was computed, it was optimized for AGN where the thermal peak is much below the X-ray band. And um, it assumes you have a power law that goes down to 0.1 keV, which is empirically not usually the case for stellar mass black hole systems. So this introduces the same sorts of issues that we saw from uh, using power law to describe the Compton component. And this is mostly an issue when the disk is hot or the power law is steep. Um, and to show you this, maybe a little bit more intuitively, this is showing you uh, what you would expect the shape to look like, um, a proper Comptonization model uh, to look like. So this is the real illumination spectrum that is shining on 
uh, the disk versus what uh, Relzil is assuming shines on the disk. And you see there's just a huge excess below the disk temperature. So this, let's see if there's a way to tackle this problem. Um, so the ideal is that you want a full uh, relativistic code that accounts for the thermal emission in the disk. It Compton scatters those photons. It self consistently produces the uh, reflection emission as well and does all of these things together. This turns out to be a rather Herculean effort and Javier has been working on this for some time, but it is, it is not yet available. So a practical fix for the meantime is you can simply chop the illumination to crudely match to do something that is less bad than this. It is not ideal, but it's better. Uh, and um, there's a very uh, a, sort of a trivial tool to do so. Um, so here's a, a practical hack for those of you doing this kind of thing. Um, here's a little uh, M define command you can plop into XBEC to define a multiplicative power law that will chop things down below some uh, I should say a multiplicative broken power law that will just chop things down below some uh, some characteristic energy. So it gives you a, a break energy B and a, a break index I. And uh, here I give you some suggestions for what are reasonable values to pick for that just based on empirically playing around with this. Um, uh, and the punchline is that this doing so, depending on how you want to implement this, adds one or even zero free parameters, but it does something that's physically more plausible. It's still deficient, but it's, uh, it can be important in getting better and more physical results. Uh, I'll also point out that Federico Garcia worked on this uh, independently, and he came up with a method that I think is a little bit more elegant than mine. Um, so if anyone is, is curious, uh, I encourage you to reach out to Federico to try, uh, you know, explore his method too. Um, in any case, I want to end with just the sort of punchline of this, which is that the, the way that we started things, the comparison between expectation in blue and uh, the, the uh, compromised result in red was, was rather poor looking. Um, the new result looks much better. So I, uh, I should point out these aren't expected to match one another uh, because the reflection does do reprocessing, um, but roughly you expect the shapes to be quite similar. So it, it at least accomplishes the major goal. Um, and here is just a, a picture of the net result where um, you have simple cut that is act, acting on the disk black body and also scattering the reflection emission that comes out of the disk. And you get something that looks like this in the end. So this would be my suggested recipe for, uh, for doing the fit instead of just a disk BB plus Relzil. And, um, that is it for that tutorial. Thanks to those of you who are not interested in reflection analysis for putting up with it. And I hope some of you who are doing reflection or, or are curious about it found it useful. Um, the major takeaways I want you to have from this talk are to have a, an understanding of the basics of these low frequency QPOs and black hole systems, have some familiarity with how black hole spins are measured in stellar mass systems, and a knowledge that while uh, Dan showed you that the spins of supermassive black holes really tend to be very high, um, nature does produce spins all the way from zero to one in stellar mass black hole systems. Um, I uh, want you to have now some basic familiarity with some of these uh, range of different neut neutron star sources. Uh, just in the interest of time, I had to leave a lot of other interesting kinds of systems, notably uh, magnetars. I didn't get to speak about those are uh, um, uh, very exciting systems. So there's a lot that, um, uh, we could talk about later, but um, I wanted to at least give you some, some highlights. And lastly, those spectral fitting suggestions are, uh, do look at what your model is predicting under the hood when you can, watch out for unphysical model behavior and runaway effects. Um, and when you can, I suggest opting for self-consistent models, uh, especially when it's easy to do so and doesn't introduce a lot of extra computational overhead or complexity. Um, and uh, specifically for the case I showed you, you wanna make sure that um, power law is being curtailed below the, the C temperature uh, of, of your input spectrum for Comptonization. And with that, I uh, will take any questions you guys might have.
May I ask a question from the distance? No. Mariano. Yeah. Nice talk, Chuck. Uh, nice. These practical things at the end, I think they are very useful. This issue of the power law shooting off at low energies and affecting your NH, et cetera, is something that is often overlooked. And the, uh, I put in the Slack uh, a link to the to the GitHub of Federico Garcia that you mentioned. Oh, perfect. Thanks, Mariano. Um, you have to, there is, unfortunately, there is not too much explanation of how to install his tools. But if you are there and you know, you know, uh, you have to do this init package and uh, LMOD in expert. Yeah, we, we can, uh, I think. It's, it's it. relatively easy, uh, but if yeah. you need help, it's not properly explained. You can contact him. I think his email is there, or you can contact me and I can uh, explain. All right, that's really appreciated. Thanks, Mariano. And one advantage of it, uh, the, the way Federico did uh, the things is that you don't add any new parameter to your model. It's just uh, the same parameter. You link parameters from the other components. Well, anyway, thank you, Chuck. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, thank you for the wonderful lecture. So I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is a little long, so please uh, correct me if I'm going wrong in my assumptions. So the first thing, uh, at all sources, uh, spectrum-wise, they're very similar to black hole sources. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, spectral models uh, suggest that they are the, at the heart state, the trun uh, disk is truncated further away. Uh, um, so so in, I would say it's, it's not, um, in both black hole systems and in um, neutron star systems, there's there's not clear cut evidence for truncation in rather bright hard states. At very low luminosities, this can happen. And, and magnetized neutron stars, um, sometimes you do see sort of uh, larger scale truncation that we, due to things like um, uh, propeller effect where you can have magnetic, um, basically magnetic pressure can inhibit the uh, accretion flow if it's uh, sufficiently strong and the accretion flow is sufficiently weak. So there are instances of this, but I wouldn't say as a rule of thumb that's clear cut for uh, either stellar mass black holes or for H-hole sources in sort of rather bright um, hard states. At very faint hard states, there is some good evidence that the disks truncate, but that's um, in the range of several percent Eddington, there's still sort of wide ranging debate about that. So actually the uh, other part of my question has some connection to this as well. Mm. So uh, in Z type sources, uh, again, assuming the, the spectrum suggests that the disk is very close to the neutron star system as such. That's a very good question. I don't, I don't know offhand how, uh, how much this has been done for, for the Z sources, um, it's certainly been done for um, a number of atoll sources. May, Tommaso may know um, if there's been um, like reflection measurements of the uh, around Z sources to assess the inner radius, how close that is to the surface. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, I don't know why that wouldn't have been done for Z sources, but I can't think of an example. Uh you, uh, but I have used BB reflect and uh, convolve with RD blur. I've not used that, itself, but I yes. found they're very close. Uh, so I, I, I'll mention, um, so Javier's group has developed a, um, a, a neutron star version of, of RELZIL. RELZIL NS. Yes, RELZIL NS. Yeah. So uh, that, um, I, I believe it's public. If it's not, um, you should talk to him when he's here to, to see about potentially getting getting access to it. Okay, so actually my final question was, mm -hmm. um, I was just trying to reconcile the spectral as well as the temporal signatures of both these sources, because you see this uh, type B QPOs uh, that you see in black hole systems, are they quite similar to the NBOs that you see in red sources? Are um, they both around the same frequency <laughs> if I'm right? It's true, I think um, the, the uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm much more a black hole guy. So uh, I will defer to um, you know, Jeremy or Tommaso. Uh, so please. There has been a red star. Mm. NBOs. 
Yes. And then you see associated jet uh, connection between type B and uh, Use a microphone because we are everything. So the question was that if uh, there's been an association between type B and, and BO, and the answer is yes. yes. Uh, there's a paper by Casella uh, quite a few years ago that makes a one to one association between three types and three types. Uh, whether Jet ejection has been seen corresponding to the uh, uh, NBO. Uh, that I don't know because things are much faster there. Mm -hmm. yes. So uh, I don't think they have the same radio coverage to yeah. actually say something like that. So the, they don't have a major boom, you know, like for transients. <laughs> These are persistent sources. Uh, and so the appearance, it's difficult to tie in the appearance of one QPO because they don't last long and they keep changing between one and the other. Yeah, I was just trying to understand because spectrum suggests uh, similarities to at all sources, but uh, time, temporal studies suggest similarities uh, with the black hole sources and Z sources. So I was trying oh, to reconcile uh, both the signatures. The, the, uh, Z sources and at all sources don't exist. He showed it. They are the same thing at high luminosity high and low luminosity. And low luminosity. And low so, I mean, you, you can call them whatever you want, but they are the same, something of the same spectrum. Okay. So the, the QPOs in the tall NZ sources are the same QPOs. Yes. Okay. Thank you for those questions. Thank you. Actually, I have so far. Oh, that's okay. Any other questions? No? Then maybe. Uh, does the track that is traced out by the uh, sources in the hardness intensity diagram, mm -hmm. like you suggested, the mass accretion rate could be the cause for the. Yes. There are certain models which suggest maybe there are some physical or radiational instabilities which are causing these kind of variations. Can you suggest, I mean, comment on. Oh, you mean to, to give you the, these the sorts of tracks? Yes. Of, of tracks? Yes. Uh, yes, there are there a handful of models, I believe, that sort of try to. Um, uh, explain this behavior with different uh, magnetic instabilities, um, but I would, you know, really suggest this. This is sort of, um, you know, proving a, a unifying connection between um, all systems. So interplay between the magnetic field and the the mass accretion rate um, on the surfaces. This is sort of the uh, uh, the business here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, and actually, I, I will, um, if, if I'm recalling correctly, one, uh, a paper that came to mind, or uh, I guess a, a result that came to mind after you, you, your question, um, I believe some of the analysis of 1701, um, its, its spectra, when it was being fitted uh, with, uh, is, is a, a paper by uh, uh, Chen Lin here. Um, so fitting a, a range of these states with models that were a black body, um, a, a, a disk black body, and Comptonization. Um, and there were some different behaviors shown between um, so, sort of different inferences about the spot size you would see uh, on the, in the Z states versus the atoll states uh, for the neutron star surface. I can't recall the specifics, but that might be a good place to peek for some insight on this. OK, thanks. Any more last, last, last question? No, I mean, just want to know, uh, uh, want to tell you that Jack is uh, here today and tomorrow. He's leaving tomorrow. So utilize his presence in, in X Vision. So. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm gonna miss next week, but I, I wish you guys a uh, wonderful rest of the, the meeting. Thank you. Thanks a lot for a nice talk.